Thank you. Um, thanks for sticking around to uh, the last film festival I went to. I walked in for the Q&A and realized that we'd sent them the version of the film without subtitles, so um, <laughs> this is incredible. <laughs> That was an interesting Q&A. Yeah. You, you spoke in English. I, I spoke in English, yeah. <laughs> we have a gift that we want to present you. Um, oh, thank you so much. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. So, how did this project come to you? How did you get to this project? Um, I... I have a, a very uh, fraught and tortured personal history with music. Um, and, you know, this is my first film because I spent my 20s, you know, working and hoping to have a career in music, uh, albeit not country music. Um, my background is in electronic music, strangely enough. I'm like a um, club rat DJ person. So, um, but you know, all. And that's sort of my social world. Like all my, I'm from New York, and all my friends are DJ music people with like, you know, bedrooms full of music equipment. And I felt like, you know, we were all so passionate about music, but there was, um, you know, there's like a strain of sadness that runs through musicians and artists in general, which is just that, you know, it's so hard to make the thing you love most in the world a, a, a sustainable part of your life. Uh, a sustainable career and to do sort of your craft with, with dignity and you know with acceptance and, and um, yeah sustainability and so um, I sort of I, I kind of always like I would watch a lot of music docs and I'd be like this is the musical equivalent of like make, only telling stories about billionaires we are we we're just telling you know music docs obviously for commercial reasons focus on well-known artists and they're they're op often kind of looking back on their career and 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 I just felt like most musicians are just trying to find that first step and always looking forward so I just I just it started with so one way of saying I, I wanted to tell the story of a musician just trying to make it trying to take that first step um, and, and into realizing their dreams and um, I didn't really want to do it in my own musical world so um, I wanted to learn about someone else's musical world, and um, I just I just had this question, which I was like, I wonder if there are country singers outside the U.S. because that would be fucking crazy. You know? <laughs> like, what like you, you know my I didn't know anything about country music except that it's the, it's such a heavily gatekept genre. You know, it's like it's very protected, it's very defended as as white America's music, and it's changing thankfully a, a bit now. But like at the time I started this project, you know, it was like. It, it, it was just so clear that I was like, if, if, if there are country music singers outside the US who are, are dreaming of country music superstardom, like, boy, do they have uh, a steep mountain to climb there. So I just, you know, I started looking around on the internet. I was just poking around um, a lot, actually. Um, and, and they're everywhere. You know, these country singers are absolutely everywhere. Um, but, but the first thing I noticed as I was looking was that um, almost all of them were sort of cosplaying as Southern Americans, if that makes sense. Like, they had internalized this sort of doubt that I had had, or, or this question that I had. It's like, could you be a country singer and be from France or, or Poland? And like, it's, it seemed like in their minds they had said, no, you can't, which is why these Polish or French or, you know, Scandinavian country singers were singing about Texas and, and you know, putting on a big Southern accent. And so, so all this, this foreign, you know, foreign-made country music that I was finding felt a little cosplay and a little silly, not, not to be like, too dismissive of it. But I was like, cool, that, you know, that'll be the story. I'll, I'll, I'll pick one of these folks and do maybe like a short, short story on them. Um, and it'll be like a little quirky and, and goofy. And then I, I one day just, someone had posted Dusty and Stone music video just under the cryptic and not very specific title, African country music. Just an African country music, so I clicked it, and um, kind of instantly, within you know, within seconds of hearing it, I was like, "These guys are, are very different." Um, they were not singing; they were singing, you know, proudly as themselves. And, like you saw in the film, they're super capable of pretending to be Southern Americans if they wanted, <laughs> but they, they were not doing that. And like the the whole thing, the whole music video uh, that we showed it briefly in the film was like, 
It was all about showing who they were and where they were from with, with, with such ease, you know, they were, they were like, this is, it, it was just clear that this was the music that fit with the story that they wanted to tell and, and how they felt about themselves and, and, and what, you know, they wanted to export to the world. And so even before, you know, I jumped on a call with them and, and we started talking about what a project would look like, I was like, these guys have a, I suspected that these guys had a profound and intimate connection to country music and, and that, you know, bore out. Now, was your producer African? She, yeah, she's Nigerian American. And so, how did you find her? Um, there is a amazing group called Brown Girls Doc Mafia. Um, any Brown Girls Doc Mafia members here? <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, but yeah, uh, and and so you know, it, you know, that's a great uh, resource for finding really talented. Uh, filmmakers of color, uh, especially for, you know, um, a film like this where I wanted the, you know, crew behind the camera to be reflective of, of um, you know, the interactions, the cultural exchange going out on screen. And um, we also, you know, probably had like a half, about a half South African, you know, field crew that was shooting uh, with us in Swaziland too. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, how long did you spend in Africa? Sounds like you basically spent an intensive week between Nashville and Texas, or so, or a couple of weeks, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, there, you know, most of the film comes from a, about 10 days of shooting, which is crazy, especially since we filmed it in 2017 and it only came out last year, but yeah, most of it comes from an intensive week uh, between, you know, Swaziland and Nashville and Texas, but I had made two trips out there before, uh, you know, and I had started interviewing them, so not knowing what things so, so it was, it was really, um, you know, two initial trips, a third sort of cross-continental trip, and then um, we actually did a pickup shoot in 2019. Um, you know, Dusty and Stones and I went on this, like, amazing road trip and that, you know, we had gotten along really well before, but it sort of created this bond and, I think, intimacy and um, friendship with us in the way that, like, traveling with someone does. Yeah. And so I, I also felt like I needed to go back to Swaziland to film a little bit and see what the footage would look like have now having that relationship with them. And um, strangely, a lot of the first you know, 10 minutes of the film comes from the final shoot, just like the teaching, the you know, stuff with them at work, um, you know, just some of the quotidian like day-to-day -day stuff was kind of made after we had really had this bonding experience. Now, did their success actually result in some spread of popularity of country music? Yeah, I, um, I mean, you know, people are so excited about this. Swaziland is, is it's a tiny kingdom, you know, it's, um, you know, about New Jersey size in terms of its area, and it's only about 1.3 million people, so, um, you know, representation is, is incredibly significant and, and um, kind of momentous there in a way that I, I could have never understood as an American coming from the most overrepresented country in the entire world, you know. Um, so for them to go to Texas, um, to have this happen was big news and, I, and it, it resulted in, you know, a, a big uptick in their performances, some of which you saw at the end. And, and I, unfortunately, I do think COVID um, really wiped out some of that momentum, but um, the film now being out has helped a little bit. Like they played a music festival in Boise, Idaho in March, which was <laughs> incredible. Like the Dusty Stone's American Redemption Tour. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. And, and they, they played to like, you know, slam sold out crowds that were going crazy, it was, it was awesome. Wow, and how did they have, uh, be associated with the film festival, the uh, yeah. performance? So the film festival is called, um, it's actually, it's not a film festival, it's a music festival called Tree Fort uh, in Boise, Idaho. It's like a mini South by Southwest and this takes over downtown Boise with like tons and tons of musicians for, for a long weekend. But they have a small film section and I was like, great, this is a, this is a music festival movie if there ever was one. So I sent it to them um, and they, they took it and then they're like, but we want to bring Dusty and Stones out. 
to play at the festival. And I was like, amazing, that sounds, that would be so cool, like, let's do it. And they're like, we don't have enough money to bring out their band, so we'll bring them out, we'll pay them, we need to have a local backing band that they could like rehearse with, you know, the day before the concert. And so as we're discussing this, we're like, wait, we, <laughs> you know, we, we've been through this before. We all saw the music, right? we, all, we, all saw, we, all, we all just saw that, right? Like, um, so to, to, you know, and then to, to Treefort's immense credit, they, they were like, absolutely, this will not happen again. And so they put me in touch, they, you know, they put them in touch and, and me in touch with this amazing local backing band. They had them all watch the film. So they all watched the film and they were like incredibly communicative with Dustin Stone before they had like, you know, they were going over everything and then they had this amazing rehearsal. And, and I mean, the Treefort like promoted the, you know, the hell out of the, the performances. So when we got there, we were like walking through downtown Boise, and people were like, you guys are those guys that came over from Swaziland, like, we're gonna be at your show. And like, it was, I mean, it was the exact opposite of that. <laughs> I have other questions I'd be happy to explore, but I want to give the audience a chance to ask something. Yes, sir? Can you talk about that song, The River? Can you talk about that song, The River? Yeah, so, um, you know, that, that song was written um, by Dusty, speculating on how his grandparents met. As you saw, the, the, the grandparents um, were such a fundamental part of their lives and their relationship. You can imagine the last film festival having to come to the Q&A and be like, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the grandparents, because they just didn't get into that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, so Dusty had written that um, song you, you know, in Moy Hope, where they're from, the, you know, especially, you know, 80, you know, 70 years ago, the river, and still, the river is really like the center of life. It's where people come to, to wash their family clothes, and it's just like a, you know, um, I, you know, I think a lot of, some of the places now in that region have like running water inside, but, but still a lot don't. And so the river is just such a central part of life and such a central meeting point, and, um, he was like, I wrote this song speculating about how my parents, how my grandparents would have met on this riverbank as uh, as teens, and he hadn't really um, verified that with them. And and one of the interesting sort of tidbits about the 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 film is that he he kind of wrote it speculatively. We recorded it, and we knew it was like, you know, such a such a banger. It was going to be the song of the the film. But then one of the last scenes we shot, he's like. I want to take my grandparents to the river and we'll just ask them how they met and I and and let's hope and, and I think it'll be something like the song. Um, uh, right. and, and because that's that's what he'd imagine. And I, and I and his grand you know, they, they passed away, you know, shortly after that that was the last shoot that we did in twenty nineteen. They both passed away, you know, over the next few years and they were so frail. And I said, Dusty, like I I, I, I don't want to do that, like we shouldn't you know, they're not really mobile, let's not do that. And he was so insistent, he's like, if we don't do it now, it'll never happen. And like, he, he said, it's fine, let's just do it. And, 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 and to his credit, he was right, because we, you know, we got the story of, of that song. Has anyone else ever recorded the song? Recorded it? No, uh, but you know, Dusty and Stones own all those masters. You know, Robert Ellis Oro was doing it out of love and enthusiasm for, for the project. So the, the songs are on Spotify, they're also on Bandcamp, um, yeah. Can you talk about their educational background? And, uh, was that an unusual thing for them to, obviously if they may, must have gone to university coming out of that community, were they the only, are they, are they only ones or is there other, others from that community? Or um, what's going on there? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's, yeah, it's, it's you know, Dusty talks about it uh, a bit in there, like, you know, same trend that happens in the U.S. and all over sort of the urban, urban, uh, rural urban migration. Um, Dusty, his, his brother, uh, Stella, who's briefly in the film, he's the one they're joking with, and he has a really nice house, and like, he's like, oh, I fly all the time. Um, yeah, I think they were just, uh, you know, they're all like, they're, 
uh, a pretty remarkable family and a really accomplished family. And so, um, you know, I think if you're from the, I, I think if you're from the rural areas and if you're like a really good student, you get you get plucked out and brought to the the best schools, and that definitely happened to them. And you know, obviously they have, um, you know, good jobs, very good jobs as far as as far as that goes. So. I wonder if you could share with us something that, that came to you that was unexpected as a result of making the film. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, <coughs> this film, I think I made this film at like peak, my peak cynicism about the United States. This was filmed in 2017, it was the first year of the Trump administration, um, and um, so I was like, not. Nah. I mean, I'm not. I couldn't say I'm like very excited about the U.S. at this moment of the year, but or like patriotic in any way. But that was, you know, that was certainly a low point. And uh, so as we were preparing to go into this, I was like, I realized that more than they had such high hopes for for what this U.S. trip was going to be, and so. Even being from here and having already traveled a bit in the South, I was just like, um, I was really astounded and moved by the ways in which this country delivered on certain fantasies that it had broadcast, and I, and I was mortified and embarrassed at the things that happened that were bad. And, and like the shooting was just, it, it was so horrendous and, and awful. and I, Obviously, I, I was already used to like mass shootings happening all the time in this country, but I, I couldn't believe that one was happening for the 10 days that these guys were visiting in the state where they were. It was just like, so um, I came out of the film, the process just feeling like um, the US is just an, an extremely, it's an extreme place, you know? Um, and I think that was that was the takeaway that, you know, this is, this is a very, <laughs> A very extreme place, um, you know. I mean, it was it was gratifying to see you know white people in solidarity with them. I mean, certainly they got a cold shoulder when they went to do the rehearsal in Texas, and the whole Texas thing was clearly a disappointment in a lot of ways. But in the bar, the guys in the studio, the, you know, the producer that made this happen. Um, I mean, I think that's you know it's affecting. Um, and it's, it's one of the things thematically, I think, that really stays with you. It's not contrived, it happens. And obviously, they were so grateful, that whole Nashville recording session and how it turned out, and what they were able to see happen to their own ideas and their own talent. Um, there was something profound in that, and I think it was, you know, it stays with you. So that's, that's part of what I think you're talking about also, that the discoveries, I mean, having to, to reconsider, in a sense, America. Yeah. With, with the ups and the, the extreme aspects, the compassion, the connections and the disconnections. Yeah, and, and also having a, you know, having a musical background and having, you know, tried to make music in my lifetime. And coming in, you know, not, not fully bought into country music yet, like knowing that this was an interesting story, but myself as like, I, I didn't necessarily yet count myself as a country fan at the outset. Um, I was so moved by those those musicians. Like it was it was truly astounding to watch them work. And 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 if there's anything a little bit like dishonest about the edit, it's that I just we had to slow it way down because they heard that those songs once and they're like, cool. I think those know something like this, and then they just like did it, you know, <laughs> like it was, they had it. and 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 and, yeah. and so I think I think country music gets a little bit of flack for being. Contemporary country music gets black for being cookie cutter and sort of, um, you know, just just you know derivative and, and, and it is in some ways. But but these guys had like a, a a musicality and a creativity that was so dialed in, and they also they listened in in a way like they didn't. I was I was terrified going into that session that they're gonna be like, okay guys, you have like a cool chorus, you have a cool verse here, but like let's do this, let's do this. But they just they listened to the songs and they're like, got it. Well, here's what. Here's what I want to bring to this, and, and they didn't change anything about the, the composition of the songs or, or this, you know, you know, the, the the structure. They really just wanted to bring what they what they had. So that was awesome. Well, 
Well, Jesse, it's a wonderful film, and congratulations, and thanks for bringing it to memory. Thanks. Thank you.